And our next speaker is Dr. Laura Waller, Associate Professor at UC Berkeley. Dr. Waller completed her bachelor and PhD training at MIT. After completing her postdoc training in Princeton University, she joined UC Berkeley as a faculty member in 2012, where she leads the computational imaging lab. She and her lab developed new methods for optical imaging with novel optics and computational algorithms. She was awarded a Chin Zuckerberg Initiative Fellowship to develop microscopes to image in deep brain structures in 2017 and also won the 2018 SPIE Early Career Award. So today, Dr. Waller is going to uh, talk about computational imaging for miniature microscopes. So let's welcome her. Thanks. Uh, all right, so I'm going to talk about uh, we do technology development only uh, and I'm going to talk about some of our computational, oh, midriscopes, sorry about that, <laughs> microscopes for, um, uh, for doing single shot 3D imaging. Uh, and this is all based on this idea of computational imaging, which is all about trying to design imaging systems in terms of both the hardware and software together. So it's kind of like a design philosophy where some stuff might be best done by the hardware and other things might be uh, best done in post-processing in your software. And you try to design those two things together to get the best of both worlds. Uh, one of the new directions within computational imaging that we're really excited about are these ideas of data-driven design or um, trying to use a machine learning to find the optimal, uh, not just the optimal algorithm to solve the image reconstruction problem, but also the optimal hardware design. So let me just give you a, a typical example. And Caleb mentioned um, the flat scope in his talk, uh, but this is a lensless microscope or a lensless camera in this case. It's just a sensor pointed at the world. So you take off your lens of your camera and you point the sensor at the world and take a picture. It looks like total garbage, um, but the light that hits the sensor is the same light that would have hit the sensor if you had the lens there. And so the question is, can we computationally bend the light rays the same way that the lens would have and reconstruct the scene. Um, in practice, you can't do this with just a sensor. Um, it's way too ill posed of a problem, although people have tried. It's uh, just going to be super, super insensitive to uh, anything. And so you, what you can do, though, is to modify the system a little bit. So in our case, we put a piece of a bumpy piece of plastic in front of the sensor. Um, like it, we call this a diffuser, it's just a scattering element. Sometimes we literally use stickers that you put on your windows so your neighbors cannot see in. Um, and then you take a picture that also looks like garbage, but now it's structured garbage. And when we reconstruct the scene, uh, we can actually get a picture back. So if I think about like the philosophy behind this kind of camera is that uh, a normal camera takes a point in your world and it maps it to a point on the sensor. And so um, you have a point spread function, which tells you, you know, how a point in the world maps onto your sensor. Well, a point in the world maps onto a point in the sensor. Of course, in microscopy, it's going to be a diffraction limited system, and so you'll see like this airy pattern instead. Uh, but you're trying to map a point in the world to a point on the sensor. With these mask-based cameras, you get rid of the lens and you put some sort of mask in front of the sensor. So uh, the Rice flat scope is one of the, one thing that you can put in front of the sensor. Uh, we're just saying that ours is going to be a diffuser, this random bumpy piece of plastic, and ours is unknown in this case. Um, then you can get this weird pattern as your point spread function. So for the diffuser, the pattern looks like a caustic pattern. It's like the bottom of the swimming pool on a hot day. It's the exact same principle because it's a random refractive surface. And this point spread function is basically um, your mapping of if there was a point in the scene on at this particular point, this is the response of the system to that point. Um, so if you see this response on your camera, you know there was a point in the scene at that particular position. You can make this dirt cheap by just uh, using double-sided scotch tape as your diffuser and the Raspberry Pi sensors, which are horrible sensors. They'll get terrible results, but it's something you can build cheap on the weekend with your friends. Don't use it for uh, fluorescence microscopy. It's not gonna be sensitive enough. Um, but actually, there's been a lot of people have been excited about this because we put everything open source. And there's a few people using these like for teaching linear algebra classes or imaging classes. Um, and there's been some uh, sort of 
amateurs who just build it at home for fun and send us their pictures, which I love seeing if you can get it to work. Okay, so uh, this is our point spread function or our system response for a single point. If I move that point to a different position in the scene, then what happens is the uh, point spread function or that caustic pattern shifts. So lateral motion in the scene corresponds to lateral shifting of this point spread function. That means the point spread function is shift invariant. If two points are on at the same time, we get the linear sum of the responses of each. That means that this system is linear in intensity. Um, and it will be for fluorescence microscopy because the fluorophores are incoherent with each other. So then we can write this all as a linear system. So we have our measurement y, our scene x, and now it's just a 2D scene. And this A matrix just writes the system response for every point in the scene. So every column represents the system response for a point in the scene. And the traditional camera tries to make this A matrix or forward model as close as possible to the identity matrix as possible. Uh, optical engineers have spent centuries trying to do this. Uh, whereas with computational cameras, the A matrix can really be anything as long as it's uh, known and invertible. So we need to know this forward model. That's a big issue. Uh, we could go measure it. We could go a point, put a point in the scene and move it around to every position and measure the system response and then plop it into this giant matrix. That would require extensive calibration and a fancy motion stage to do that calibration, which we don't want to require. Um, we're gonna do some mixture of measuring it, modeling it, and machine learning it. And we're gonna rely on this, this shift invariance property that moving a point in the scene shifts the caustic pattern on your, on your sensor. And so when that's true, it means that every column of this A matrix is the same as the one before it, it's just shifted. So the A matrix is just, is just shifted copies of the same thing. So you don't need to measure the whole A matrix, you just measure one caustic point spread function, and then you, um, and then you uh, copy it over and shift it. Or in fact, you don't even instantiate this gigantic A matrix because this is corresponding to a deconvolution. And so we can do deconvolutions in Fourier space really efficiently. It's just a couple of FFTs. So uh, the problem that we are trying to solve to reconstruct the scene is to minimize the difference between our measurement and the expected measurement given our current estimate of the scene X and then update that estimate iteratively. Um, subject to some constraints, that the light is positive, that there's no negative intensity, and uh, any kind of regularizer that you choose to add. And this can be a really important addition to uh, microscopy techniques where we can make assumptions on what type of images we're looking at, like that they're sparse or, they're, um, or their gradient is sparse, et cetera. So here's just some data from our regular camera. So here's the raw data, reconstructed scene, pretty picture, um, and the video, you can see there's lots of artifacts here. It's not like photography quality video. Um, and, and that's largely from model mismatch that we didn't calibrate perfectly. But it also points to like th these kinds of cameras are not gonna be replacing your cell phone cameras anytime soon. They're probably gonna be used for doing other things. And so it's a compact and cheap kind of camera, um, but it's not really super high photographic quality. Um, so we went after things that these cameras can do that regular cameras cannot do. And one of those is 3D because a regular camera, if things are out of your focus plane, they're simply blurred and the information is gone. You can't bring it back. Whereas if you think about a lensless camera, then as you go to, as you move that point source to different depths, you just get a different response. In fact, it's just scaling. And so you can predict the response of the system for any 3D position from a single calibration measurement of this caustic pattern. And we have a different response for every 3D position, which means we have a chance to reconstruct 3D information from a single 2D measurement. So that's what we did. We have a single 2D measurement. So say it's a megapixel camera, you have a million pixels of measurement. You're trying to solve now for a million pixels across say a hundred depth planes. So you're now trying to solve for a hundred times more things than you measured. Um, and you have this gigantic uh, forward model, or this A matrix. Uh, so we've solved the calibration and computation problem of that by using this shift invariance model uh, where you can, but it's still massively underdetermined. And to solve that, we're going to go for uh, compressed sensing. So everyone knows you can compress images after you capture them, and you're trying to represent uh, everything about the image in a smaller amount of data without losing any information from the image. 
Um, so compressed sensing is about doing all of that in the capture stage. So don't capture all of that information if you don't need it. Don't capture 10 megabit, megapixels and then compress it down to one megapixel. Just capture the one megapixel of important information. Um, and so you can't just take an image and throw away pixels and expect it to keep the same amount of information. But our system is actually satisfying the constraints of this compressed sensing approach such that um, if we take our raw image and we just delete 80% randomly of the pixels, we can still get a good reconstruction from just 20% of the data. And this is because the data is severely multiplexed. That, that point mapping to lots of pixels on the sensor is a form of multiplexing that makes compressed sensing possible. We can throw away 90% of the data or even 98% of the data, we can still kind of see what's going on in this image. And so rather than taking 2D images and then throwing away information, we're gonna use the full 2D image. So this is our oh, weird, full captured image here, and then use it to reconstruct a higher dimensional image in 3D. Um, so this is a 3D reconstruction of a little leaf. I'm showing you the reconstruction spinning. We're reconstructing about 128 depth planes here. Um, so we get 128 times more things reconstructed than we measured, which would be impossible if you didn't have these uh, sparsity priors that we're making in order to do compressed sensing. So what's really exciting about this is that it breaks the typical like speed uh, space bandwidth product trade-off that you get in microscopy. So space bandwidth product is basically just the number of things you can resolve. So it's the, it combines the field of view and the resolution. If you have high resolution and high large field of view, you're gonna have a large space bandwidth product. And now you can attempt to get that even with single shot microscopy that has high speed like this with our diffuser cam. So this is where I think it could be really exciting for microscopy because you break away from this need to uh, capture more data if you want to reconstruct more things. And so you can get at doing things fast, like this single shot 3D with good resolution across a big volume. So Grace and our lab uh, built the, the mini, the, the flat version of this. It's just like some filters and our diffuser, which is a, a random micro lens array uh, on top of a sensor. And she can look at neural activity with this. So we designed it to be about the resolution of, of the neurons of the zebrafish. Um, some stuff that we worked on that I'm not really gonna talk about is this caustic pattern is not the perfect point spread function. Um, a better point spread function is a lens, which has a point here because then you have better SNR but then you don't get good 3D information. So you could make an array of microlenses, but then you have a problem with it being periodic that as you shift that pattern by a regular amount, then you get the same pattern again. And so there's some ambiguity there in the field of view. So what we do is use random microlenses that have uh, a range of different focal lengths to, to highlight, like have a sharp image at different, uh, different depths within the volumetric field of view. Um, Okay, so finally to mini scopes. The, the thing that I wanted to talk about is that now we can put all of this into a mini scope. So we took uh, the regular mini scope design and we hacked it to be a, uh, this diffuser mini scope or whatever you want to call it. We call it mini scope 3D. But basically, we put the, the space mask is that diffuser thing I'm talking about. Now it's a micro lens, a random micro lens array. And we put this right on the top of the grin lens, which is the back focal plane of that grin lens. If you treat the grin lens like the objective, it's in the back focal plane. And then you have some propagation distance. So the tube lens is gone. Um, and you just have some distance between the space mask and the sensor. And it's the caustic distance that's appropriate for, for our uh, system. So you end up with this new mini scope being smaller and lighter weight because you made it shorter and you removed the tube lens and all you added was this phase mass. Um, but now it can do 3D instead of just 2D. Uh, it sacrifices the, the lateral resolution a little bit to give you this the third dimension. Um, so let me just give you some, some data from this. So this is with our phase mask in the back focal plane. Um, and here's the point spread function we get. So you get randomly focused spots. And as I go to different depths, Oops, sorry about that. As I go to different depths, different spots come into focus. And so when I take a single shot image, then, oh, I don't know what's going on here. Then uh, this is my raw data that I'm capturing. And from this, I can reconstruct uh, 3D information for every frame of that video. So I'm getting uh, 
fast 3D imaging with a pretty simple uh, and small and cheap microscope. Uh, if you've seen stuff about light field mini scopes, uh, this is how they compare. Basically, the light field uh, mini scope or the light field microscope in general, and this is Fourier light field microscope, which is fundamentally has a better resolution across a larger field of view than the regular light field microscope. It has sort of like preferred focal planes in which it gets its best resolution, whereas our Fourier diffuser scope is what we're calling it here, gets a wider range of depth planes across which it can have decent resolution. It's sort of like spreading the resources across a bigger uh, depth range, which is important for 3D because if you just want one plane to have good resolution, you can just do 2D imaging. So here's sort of like the volume that we can get and the the resolution and of course we can get resolution poor resolution outside that volume it's just degrading as you go out so it depends what you're looking for here um so the the face mask that we use is this random micro lens array we have we tried a lot of different ways to fabricate these things to spec and we finally found some good ways um, and we can get about three micron resolution that's what we were after here uh, across this pretty big field of view. So here's some raw data captured from this uh, diffuser mini scope of water bears um, or tardigrades from uh, Saul Crater's lab at UCSF. And then uh, some raw data and then reconstructed neural slices, um, g camp tag neurons, um, some more neurons, just showing that you can actually see some axons here. Uh, more raw data. Uh, I'm happy to send this to people or, or discuss later. Uh, I'm not the applications person. Uh, we work with people who are using these for real world applications. Will has been awesome. Um, and then just a comparison. And for people who've seen the mini light field microscope, um, we are the lightest weighted one and we can get, so, so we lose some resolution, um, keep a pretty big field of view. And this is sort of like a volumetric field of view. Uh, and get decent axial resolution for, and it's all single shot. Um, so our frame rate is only faster because we have the time sensor. Uh, but this is kind of like the specialty of our lab is doing these computational imaging designs uh, that are easily reproducible. And that doesn't just mean that our code is open source online. It means we try to make the hardware simple and easy to replicate as well. So if anyone wants to try this, we'll be very happy to work with you um, and send you phase masks, et cetera. So happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Laura. This is fascinating. Uh, because of time, we will save the question to the breakout room. And also, you can leave your question in the chat. And with that, thanks again, Laura. This is so interesting.